Welcome to Celebrating Act Two, and the virtual gourmet John Mariani is our guest today. How are you doing, John? Very, very well. Just had a wonderful meal last night at a steakhouse in New York. Ooh, John, my favorite are steakhouses, I have to admit. Uh, in, a, in a recent uh, video you were mentioning, people, uh, people seem to love Italian food. For me, it's a steakhouse, and I know being a New Yorker, I haven't been there for many, many years, but I remember in New York, Manhattan, filled, filled with steakhouses. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you know, you're in luck about the Italian because I would say most steakhouses in America these days have Italian food on it. And some are kind of steakhouse slash Italian. So uh, you can satisfy both urges in one place. Hmm. Well, that's a good point. Um, tell me about the steakhouses, uh, the scene, the steakhouse scene in New York City. How is it? Well, first, let me state that as an American, um, I think that the one thing that Americans do well, almost obviously better than everybody else is a steakhouse. Uh, we kind of pioneered what it, it should be and could be, whereas even if you go to London where they have great beef, um, it's grass-fed beef, it's not corn-fed beef. Same goes for France, same goes for Italy. Uh, the beef does not taste the same as really great American beef. Having said that, um, back in the speakeasy days even, and uh, certainly after the war, we had in New York um, Peter Lugas in Brooklyn, Gallagher's in the theater district, Palm, which is where all the journalists used to go under the Third Avenue L, uh, Chris Sella, a whole whole bunch of them, which were kind of, I wouldn't say rowdy places, but they were manly men places where you would certainly bring a woman. It wasn't that the women were disdained at all. They uh, brightened the room, in fact. And they each had their own uh, ambience. The Palm had, had all these caricatures on the wall, so forth. <clears throat> all of those steakhouses bought their meat from the 14th Street meat markets, which used to line that street over on the west side. They were USDA prime stamped dry aged beef. It was extraordinary. Absolutely. I mean, I, as a young kid, I thought this is what steak tastes like because it, <laughs> I didn't have any other thing to judge it by. Well, I learned later on that in other steakhouses in other parts of the country, they weren't using uh, USDA Prime, or well, they were using it of the caliber that was obtainable in New York on 14th Street. And what happened was, as steakhouses proliferated in the United States in the 1990s and since then, they all wanted high quality steak. Well, you cannot increase the quantity of USDA Prime. You just don't say, you know, send in another steer, or that they're, they're going to butcher it in its prime. Um, that is, in fact, a program that the USDA runs voluntarily um, for steakhouse uh, purveyors, and not steakhouse purveyors, but for the meat industry. Uh, they will ask an inspector to come and say, which of these, depending upon the marbling, intramuscular marbling, is prime, has more fat, <clears throat> and perfectly throughout. Then choice, which is the next down. Top choice is very, very good. And then you get down from there to universal and hospital and airline grades. You know? So when this proliferation took place in the 1990s across and the chains, including Palm, including uh, Ruth's Chris and Morton's and Smith Walensky and a slew of others, Capitol Grill, <clears throat> when they came on the scene, well, you obviously can't have hundreds of thousands of more steaks of that quality coming in every week. And we are talking hundreds of thousands because the typical steakhouse is probably going to serve, I don't know, two, three thousand steaks a, a week. You can't get that quality. Also, the, the 14th Street meat market uh, just declined and went out of business. Now there's a bunch of crummy boutiques there. It used to be very high-end boutiques. And that was a new neighborhood of burgeoning. It was gentrified and what used to be just a bunch of trucks lined up and putting into these coal storage locker, those days are gone, okay, completely gone. So the amount of that quality beef is simply not available. So when I turn to the New York Steakhouse, which is what pioneered kind of the look 
originally was store sawdust floors and so forth, and uh, jackets and little bow ties on the uh, on the uh, waiters and so forth. So forth. Um, when that was that was pioneered back in the 40s and 50s, and, and everybody copied it. Now um, there are many many glamorous, uh, elegant steakhouse all over. But what do I like about it besides the fact that it is uh, the thing that we do uniquely well? Um, I'm assuming that the stakes, if not the quality I was speaking of so highly, that the stakes, whether you're getting them in El Paso, Texas at a good steakhouse or in Chicago where you'd think you would, but you don't always, um, the stakes are going to be very good. You know, And you're going to pay for them. You're going to pay $50, $60 for a strip steak or a, a porterhouse. You know? um, but it's going to be a big portion that only a trencherman can finish and not take home. Okay. So you walk in, and I'm not saying that every place is as cordial as many now are, especially out of out, out of New York. Peter Luger's, you know, you come, come, I have a seven o'clock reservation? Yeah, so does everybody else. Wait at the bar. Um, at Smith and Walensky, they, I've seen on more than, more than one occasion, a woman comes in alone or without a man, they look, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, when your partner arrives, you know, so meanwhile, wait at the bar. There's a lot of that. But generally speaking, and I, I, I credit the middle, uh, rather the Near Eastern or Far Western, I, the Croatians, the Slovenians, the Albanians, the Montenegrins who have taken over the industry and their cordiality and hospitality is second to none. So you enter into this, usually a grand space, not always. And I'm to, uh, the one I went to yesterday it's called Benjamin Steakhouse. It's been around since 2007. Uh, every, uh, the owners used to work at Peter Lugas, where they learned their trade. Okay? Um, the ovens are specially built, as at most steakhouses, to go up to 900, 1,000 degrees to get this char on the outside while keeping it medium rare inside. You seat, you're seated at, seated at a commodious table, not jammed up to the next guy. There's double white tablecloths, which soaks up a lot of uh, the tritus, which is always cleared. And in the case of Spark Steakhouse in New York, they roll at dessert time, they roll the first tablecloth and then put on another on top of that. It's a lovely little uh, little ballet that they do there. Okay? The glassware is usually of the better than average quality. The wine lists are now extraordinary. A wine, a steakhouse that does not have 500 labels in uh, in its in its inventory is uh, not much of a steakhouse at all. At Benjamin's, they've got over a thousand, and they have tens of thousands of wines on premises. And across the street, they have uh, their own little warehouse where they store the rest of it. So you can get anything you want at any price you want. American largesse. Okay. What is the what are the appetizers going to be? They're going to be big fat jumbo shrimp cocktail. They're going to be clams oregano done with big uh, um, um, cherry stone or little neck crabs. They're going to have crab meat, which is made with jumbo lump crab meat or at least lump crab meat. They're going to have crab cakes. Okay, they're going to some of them not all have lobsters, three pounds, four pounds, five pound lobsters, which you find nowhere else in the world. Steamed, grilled, stuffed, whatever you want. Okay. A rack of lamb, a beautiful American lamb, not that New Zealand chunk that so many places have. All right. <clears throat> um, so now you're set, and then there's the side dishes. Mashed potatoes crammed with butter, onion rings, tall as this, a whole stack of them, crisp, but when you bite in, you taste the onion. Uh, a lot of places have, have filler in there, you know. There are French fries which are uh, cut on the premises, cottage fries or home fries, which are always delicious, cream spinach. How can you not like, even if you hate spinach, cream spinach is more cream and butter than there is spinach in there. So you're going to love that too. You're presented with a steak knife, sawtooth steak knife. Um, and because, oh, well, the meat has to be very tender. Can you cut it with a butter knife? No, that's not a good steak, pal. That's a steak that is a filet mignon, which has no muscle tissue. That's why you cut through it. There's no muscle tissue in there, no muscle fat. So you need to not saw. Well, you would if you order it uh, uh, well done. You're going to have to saw through it. Of course, if you do order it well done, you should be thrown out of the restaurant. 
Um, it's, it's just absolutely <laughs> full of money. Um, and then, then you move on to dessert. And there's always a New York style cheesecake. Um, many, many, many uh, New York steakhouses do not even attempt to make their own because they get it from a place up in the Bronx called S and S Cheesecake, which is just considered the best uh, uh, American Jewish style or, or Italian style cheesecake uh, anywhere. And then they're going to have profiteroles or a chocolate sundae. And it's going to be three, four scoops of ice cream. Again, largesse, largesse, largesse. Would anyone like a, um, oh, I didn't even mention cocktails, steakhouse places. They usually have a really good bartender back there. Not just some 22-year-old kid who's making margaritas with basil oil and stuff. These guys are really how to make a cocktail. Um, and then you get the bill and your heart <laughs> faints a little, but... You can't say you didn't have a wonderful meal and a wonderful evening and you got exactly what you wanted. And if you come back next week or next month, I guarantee it's going to be the same, which is why they're e so easy to recommend if they've been around for a while. Um, that they're always going to be the same five years from now, 10 years from now. And uh, so, yeah, I, I salute the um, the New York Steakhouse as a great institution. Um, the media like the New York Times and a few others, Los Angeles Times, barely ever cover them because but it's always the same menu. It's always the home fries and the, and the steak and the fatu. And so it's always the same menu. They're not all the same. They're, not, they're never all the same. Some do some things better than others. The soups, lobster bisque, uh, barley soup. Um, it's all there in profusion. And um, I dare anybody but a uh, vegetarian not to go. Well, you know, when the French guys, the chefs, like Alain Ducasse and so forth, when they come to America, where do they want to go? To another French restaurant? No. They want to go to that, that steakhouse, that Benjamin place. You know, I want to go there and have the big ribeye. The... <laughs> All right, John, when I come to New York again, which I hope will be soon, I All want right. you to take me to Benjamin's. I certainly will. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.